You guys spoke, I listened, so how about we keep this monthly album review format going, shall we? Before we get into the reviews today, I just want to remind you guys of the existence of the Nordic Sound Channel's Patreon page. Uh, we just had our first listening circle uh, for all the premium tier patrons uh, last week, and it was a blast, honestly, and one of the patrons said something that really you know, resonated with me, and that is that the practice of talking about music is a practice of processing and dealing with your emotions. Um, and so in that little way, I think that's a really valuable uh, little summary of why I think um, something like a listening circle is very important for so many of us. Um, and then also, uh, with the 1st of April, as well as the 1st of every month going forward, uh, there is the uh, Nordic Sound Journal, which is a monthly downloadable newsletter with album reviews, columns, uh, singles, current events, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and that is the best way to support the work that I do here for the Nordic Sound channel. Uh, so if any of that interests you, any of the actual goodies you get, or just the idea of uh, supporting me more directly, head on over to patreon.com slash Nordic Sound channel uh, to sort of see what we have going on over there. All right, so with the Patreon stuff out of the way, let's get into the March album releases because March was a pretty crazy month for off the beaten path Nordic music. Starting, of course, with Lindy Feihela and Dave Farna's Eyelets album. So I did not even attempt to cover up my excitement for this album. Ever since I saw the uh, artwork, I knew that this art belonged to something that I had to listen to. Um, and even with those high expectations, this album delivered in every way. So as a longtime fan of Lindy Feihela's work with Dave Farna ever since Seafarer uh, back in 20, was that 21? I think it was 2021. Uh, I feel that I can confidently say as someone who's listened to all three of the albums so far that Eyelet is this collaborative's best work yet. So as I sort of alluded to in my interview with Lindy Fi from a couple weeks ago, um, the word that keeps jumping out to me about this album is melancholy. Uh, and this album is nothing short of a melancholic masterpiece, perfectly capturing the feeling of looking out over the silvery waves over a lonely coastline. Uh, with many of the lyrics also dedicated to not just the sea, but the relationship with the cosmos, you know, the moon and the stars. And also, as I mentioned in that interview, as someone who recently moved away uh, from a life spent growing up within a short drive uh, from any coastline, be it the Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic Ocean, um, this album is the perfect escapism for me. Now, as someone who lives in the high desert of Colorado, I don't think I could be any further away from coastline uh, at the moment. Um, and so this album also serves that special little place uh, for me to sort of, if I sort of miss the smell of brine uh, and I need to feel like I'm sort of watching the ocean, uh, this album has just put me right there. And that is something that's not easy to accomplish when you were writing and producing music. So back to the music itself, Lindy Fai's voice and lyrics are probably at their most heartfelt and intimate they've been in any of the three albums so far. And a genuine tear was dragged from me, uh, and this cold heart more than a few times throughout my first and second and third listens through the album. And while some tracks create a deep nostalgia and longing for a time that I can't exactly pinpoint, uh, there are also some surprisingly catchy hooks on this album. Don't think that it's just shoegaze front to back. Uh, Low Water is probably the best example of one of the best hooks or catchiest lines uh, on the album that really sticks with you and it's impossible to drag out of your ear. But then over to the instrumental work of Dave Farna, uh, this is also probably their best work yet, uh, particularly their tasteful use of melodic synths, uh, and their ear for ambient effects. Um, one of the downsides to working with electronic music uh, is that you sort of have endless options. Uh, and as I've talked with a few musicians on here recently, uh, sort of boundaries are good for creativity. And the sheer size of a synth library nowadays uh, is the complete antithesis of boundaries and limitations. So it creates a sort of... Uh, dynamic where the more self-control you have, uh, I think the more effectively you can use synthesizers. And that is what's going on here with Dave Farna's work. Um, all of the electronic work 
flows together with the entire sound palette and more importantly accompanies and uh, complements Lindy Fi's voice so beautifully without ever overpowering it. But then at the same time they're not subservient to the voice at all because they still have their own moments where they get to shine and be like hey we're part of the band too. Uh, again Low Water is a great example of this. When that synth line crawls in for the very first time that sort of sticks with you uh, throughout the rest of the album and keeps your ear listening uh, for more synth work uh, as the album goes on. So altogether, these elements paint the album itself as a work floating through the endless depths of the North Sea, making Islet a masterwork of melancholia and atmosphere. And with Islet, I really don't think that the ways themselves could have wanted for a more beautiful homage to their eternal dance with the cosmos. So now let's flip the genre and the style completely to talk about Thomas Erikson's Udod, the true black metal experience. So, Thomas Erikson has been making waves in the black metal scene since the release of critically acclaimed Den Vandrundaskuga, uh, following a Band of the Week endorsement from Fenris himself at the end of 2015. What captivates me most uh, about Erikson is his devotion to black metal not just as like a, a subculture, but also as an art form. If you've yet to do yourself the pleasure, a listen through his podcast, the Thomas Erickson podcast, puts his dedication to the understanding, significance, history, and eccentricities of the genre on full display. And as you all know, I'm a huge fan of Mork, his sort of main project, made evident by the presence of Dupe uh, on my top 10 of 2023 list. Not only because of Erickson's almost musicological uh, dedication to the genre, but because he just sort of gets it in a way that I cannot put into words or pinpoint. All of this preamble is necessary because Udod is his latest project which not only complements his work in Mork, but further shows the depths to which Erickson will plunge to explore every nook and cranny of black metal in this broader musicological obsession with black metal that he demonstrates. So the best way I can put it is that if Mork is a grand stave church in a scenic Norwegian valley, Udod is the creepy shack in the woods out back that your parents warn you about. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the values of black metal or some of the values of black metal, uh, this is meant as a complement of the highest order. So where Mork's music weaves its layers and textures throughout the listening experience in this elegant form of arts like a tapestry, the experience of Udod is a cold, lonely, austere experience that sort of reminds you, instead of this beautiful, intricate painting, it's like the creepy, cryptic engravings left on the walls of that wooden shack in the woods. The production of this album is intentionally and unapologetically lo-fi, with the opening track, where a guitar duet sort of uh, plays something that I haven't, you know, went to, I haven't gone in to see, like, is this a fugue? Uh, but it's... It, so, it sound reminds you uh, of a fugue with the way that the, the lines intermingle and interact. Um, but even though in something like a fugue, it's very important that you hear all of the voices and how they play together and how the lines work, leaves it fully distorted with only barely enough definition to just kind of uh, make out the notes. Uh, and so with a fugue, that's sort of like the most black metal way you can approach a fugue. It's like the notes are there. I'm just going to distort it to hell so you can't actually tell what they are. And then from there, from the opening moments until the last, Udod is a chilling, haunting experience that leaves me begging for more. You all know how much I lament the one-dimensional nature of mainstream music production, uh, and that includes heavy metal, uh, that leaves too many albums sounding the same. Uh, and this, this is the answer that I crave. An original, sonic experience that utilizes the strengths of the genre to create something truly unique and memorable from a sonic perspective. So, Thomas, well done with Udod. I would love to have you on the channel because uh, there's a lot to talk about in here. I told you guys this was an eclectic, off-the-beaten-path month, so let's flip over again to traditional Danish bagpipes. So, according to Mads Schuller Henningsen uh, of the incredible Floating Sofa Quartet and Spilke i Kirke, uh, Rune Segen is the first Danish album to feature the Scandinavian bagpipe in a leading role. But this is just one aspect of Rune Segen which adds to its historical and musical significance, for it's also an album featuring 12 tunes from the great Niels Niller Erik Rasmussen, one of the only members of his generation left still playing on Danish pipes today. So each of these 12 tunes are inspired uh, by stories and landscapes around the area of Sagan, uh, hence the name, 
which is a small region on the island of Bornholm. Longtime listeners of this channel will probably recognize uh, Bornholm, uh, especially if they are fans of the musical Lorenzen's uh, Emilia and Jonas. You guys will be very familiar with the music of Bornholm. So also according to Henningsen, the approach of recording and mixing this album, done by our friend Jakob Hilund, uh, was the one that captured the ragged and imperfect spirit of traditional dance music. I believe this approach also maintains a level of listenability, uh, as 30 minutes of straight bagpipe tends to wear on listeners after a while, uh, which I find is exacerbated even further if the bagpipe is too cleanly recorded. If you just get 30 minutes of incredibly polished non-stop bagpipe that's going to wear on you, even if you swear that you are the most dedicated follower of the bagpipe. But not once when listening to Rune Segen, however, did I even glance at a timestamp. Uh, for the whole experience, whisked me away to the Baltic and had a playful air about it that kept me engaged throughout the entire album's runtime. So for anyone looking to further explore uh, the endless varieties of traditional Scandinavian dance and folk music, I highly recommend Rune Segen uh, for not only its addition to esoteric folk records, which I always gladly welcome, but also for the remarkable level of musicianship on the album from all involved. All right, now let's get proggy with Iterum Natas from The Infinite Light. The spirit of 70s prog is alive and well in the latest installment from Jesse Heikinen. Uh, this was easily the most daunting album review to approach this month for me, just because of how eclectic, avant-garde, off-the-wall this whole record is from front to back. But I finally learned to embrace the chaos of From the Infinite Light once it clicked with me that this was a prog rock record at its very core, in my view at least. So one of my favorite parts of teaching music appreciation here at CU Boulder is the week or so we spend on prog rock of 70s and 80s because of just how weird it is to the current generation of students, but in a productive way that really shakes up their expectations of what to expect from rock or heavy metal. But maybe even more importantly, I admire the prog subgenre's dedication to the idea that a full-length album can develop narratively in the same sense of an opera or a symphony to tell a sonic story which From the Infinite Light delivers on impeccably. And therein lies a fascinating contradiction of From the Infinite Light. It is incredibly varied in its composition and does in fact keep you on guard wondering what you're going to hear next. But at the same time, there's this unifying force that I cannot pinpoint exactly. The overture kicks off the album with a very Danny Elfman-esque composition using an audacious harmonic palette that tells you you're in for one hell of an avant-garde adventure throughout the album. But just as soon as you settle in for that, sort of being like, okay, this is an avant-garde, a very progressive experience. Uh, this gleaming eternity gives you, which is just the second track, gives you an absolute banger of a straight prog rock tune with a bass line that absolutely slays. And so then you're like, oh, so the overture was just weird, and now we're in, now we're in sort of this prog rock area. But then a manifested nightmare kicks in on track number three and gives you black metal vibes constantly over the chorus before you're back in the avant-garde world of Ambrosia with a tantalizing vocal number. This is just the first half of the album where you're going through just this much stylistically. Uh, and that's sort of why I love Prague so much. It keeps you on your toes. Now, while this might sound daunting on paper for those of you not really accustomed to that Prague experience, I assure you that this album somehow remains cohesive in spite of all these varied elements. That's the sort of artistry of prog, in a sense. Take as many conflicting elements as possible and try to thread them together into a coherent album. It's what always keeps me coming back to the genre, whether it's Opeth, Baroness, Late Sword, or now Iterum Nata. It's such a rich listening experience that gives you something new to appreciate with each repeated play. So now let's tread some uncharted waters here for this channel with some jazz. Folk jazz. From the Nils Oakland Bonds album, Jenskin. The eclectic hardanger fiddle maestro uh, Nils Oakland and his band are finally back with a follow-up to their acclaimed Lusning from 2017, taking you on a sonic journey through instruments and melodies in a form vaguely resembling jazz, but evades any precise genre label uh, that can be made confidently, but jazz is the greater umbrella that this falls under. The personnel on this album includes Rolf Erik Nystrom on sax, Sigbjörn Appeland uh, on organ, Hokan Morsteiner on percussion, Mats Elitsen on double bass, and of course, the legendary Niels Oakland himself on fiddle. So it's a special thing when you stumble upon an album that becomes a part of you 
in the way that this album has within just the first couple tracks. And that is exactly what happened with me and Jenskin. The album opens with a track that stopped me in my tracks, uh, Minimalvos, uh, which is a reworking of the Gubransdalen melody uh, March Finienta, without the waltz accent and with the melody stripped down to its bare essentials. And with Hardanger Fiddling usually focused on pumping it full of ornamentation as sort of like a personal uh, stamp, uh, this makes the melody almost entirely unrecognizable when you take all of those embellishments and ornamentations away. So a little context here. I'm a sucker for any fusion of jazz and folk. I, I could go on, but jazz and folk is a hybrid that always tickles me in a very unique way. You take a fiddler, give them a drum kit and a double bass to comp, and I'm sold. That's all it takes, really, you know, as long as long as the musicianship is there. And with a bit of background, you can understand why I'm currently so obsessed with this album and have the vinyl on the way. But enough about me. For those unfamiliar, Nils Oakland himself is a world-class fiddler, I would argue, a legend. And with this incredible band backing him up, there's really nothing he can't do if he sets his mind to it, with Jenskin putting this versatility on full display. Over the years of touring around the world, the band has picked up many musical ideas and inspirations along the way that they've put to work on this album, such as the tune from Cairo, uh, picked up from a flautist uh, Ahmed El Arnab from Cairo, uh, and an old Norse tune from Shetland used in the track Tilly Plump. So you go all the way from Cairo to Shetland in this album, and to many more places too. So the variety of soundscapes, styles, and timbres you hear on this album are astounding. But without giving you stylistic whiplash that you tend to get from fusion albums of a similar nature, or prog, uh, right, you get that stylistic whiplash pretty easily, or you can. Uh, but on the contrary, this album is oddly cozy and comforting in spite of its dynamic nature. If you think of the whole weird subculture of lo-fi music here on YouTube, what makes it cozy and comforting is its lack of dynamics. You put a, uh, a you put a high cut filter on everything. You make sure it's very calm, repetitive, and that's why people put it on while they're doing menial tasks. So the idea that something this dynamic can also be comforting sort of goes to show that lo-fi or comfort doesn't need to just be monotone, right? And just to demonstrate uh, this comforting nature, the Sort of the morning I discovered this album uh, was a, a few days after we had a huge blizzard here in Colorado. Uh, since it's a desert, the snow doesn't stick around long, so it, it was almost 75 yesterday. No snow at all, except for up on the mountains. Uh, but, but, as the snow was sort of like resting on the ground in the morning and the sun was starting to come up, you get the alpen glow, there's like this violet hue and all the birds are sort of trying to figure out what the hell just happened, where did that snow come from? Uh, and, you know, they're all singing out there. And... It was just a beautiful morning, and I sort of found this album and put it on, and it just gave me this level of comfort that I just don't think I've felt in a very long time. And that is why I immediately went to go buy the buy the record, uh, so I could have it physically, because when an album becomes a part of you so easily, that's when I think it's worth uh, sort of forking the money over for a physical copy. But anyway, this album, I just cannot advocate for it enough and i know that it is off the beaten path for a lot of you watching uh, jazz is not something we talk about on this channel nearly enough uh, i want to try and fix that in the near future um but please give this album a listen uh, even if you're intimidated by jazz for whatever reason put it on i really think you're going to find something in this album that you love so as is the theme for this month, let's flip over again to the crushing world of doom metal with Hamferd's Men Guds Hander Stark. So the Faroese outfit Hamferd is back with a follow-up to their 2018 uh, Talmsen's Likam, apologies, do not speak Faroese, hope that's even remotely correct, uh, with powerful, brooding work of pure elegaic doom. With Jan Eldara, uh, also of Yaltun, at the helm with his dynamic voice able to switch seamlessly between powerful growls and soaring cleans in a way that very few can, Hamferd comfortably sits in the same doom niche as bands like My Dying Bride and Pallbearer. But don't let that comparison fool you into thinking that their music doesn't stand on its own. While their straight-up doom sections march forward with all the glacial brutality you want from a doom album, uh, their personality most clearly shines in the striking contrast they display between their clean and heavy sections. 
One track you can fall entranced into is the ethereal balladry of Glymen, uh, but then find yourself dragged along with the filthy mammoth march of Hvulia. Uh, and of course, in some tracks such as Albayr or Fendregar, uh, my personal favorite, you get the same contrast all at once between just the verse and the refrain. The clean sections of their songs allow Yalm to fully stretch his wings while showing the band itself to be fully dynamic enough to execute these vastly different styles without any stumbling. Further, the contrast makes the pure doom sections of this album all the more brutal. So in summary, as a huge doom guy, this album pretty much checks all of my boxes, stunning album artwork of course included. The artistry is top notch, the lyrics flow smoothly with the music, the riffs crush absolute face, and the balladic sections are absolutely captivating. While I'd love to see even more of those more heavy doom sections in future albums, that doesn't take away anything from my appreciation of Menguth's Honda Stark uh, as it is, a work of art that I see myself returning to time and time again. Okay, now to remind you guys that I have not completely forgotten about the core audience of this channel. There's a new Dark Folk, New Age, Independent, whatever you want to call it, album from the Swiss duo Nordstilla called Odringal. So in my interviews on the channel, you're probably quite familiar with the well-worn conversations I have with other musicians in the Dark Folk scene regarding the sameness of the genre. And how a lack of originality or daring in new musicians can lead to a complacency that's bad for the genre overall. As this conversation tends to focus on the rut without acknowledging those trying to break the mold, I want to use this review here to spotlight a group that is doing just that, Nordstilla's Odringo. So about their music, the Swiss duo writes, a music project born with the, with the desire to reconnect with the invisible, the hidden treasure, forgotten things. Our music is all about nature, devotion, and honesty. In this very loud world, and this is the important part, I think, in this very loud world, we wanted to create something reduced to the really essential. Something where you have to be quiet in order to hear. Our songs have not the typical structure of a verse, chorus, and bridge. It's more like telling a story through music. We want to take people on a journey of ethereal beauty. So to this end, it is really impressive to me just how minimalist Nordstilla's approach is to the music on Odrungal, while still managing to keep my attention the whole way through. While the instrumentation is bare bones between bells, gongs, and the buka horn, uh, where this duo really stands out is in their use of harmony rem reminiscent of early medieval organ or chant, something oddly underutilized in a genre that is so obsessed with that time period. Uh, and in this way, their soundscape bears a striking resemblance to Trio Medieval at points, a group I also adore. And while the album has some of its more avant-garde moments, the track Round comes to mind, this album is utterly spellbinding, in my opinion. It's meditative, but not self-indulgent. It's minimalist, but not boring. These contradictions are often so hard to overcome, especially as a new group. But Nordstilla accomplishes what they set out to do with confidence, grace, and elegance. Aldrungal definitely reminds you of the power of silence and focus in a loud, chaotic world, and through their enchanting ancient harmonies, the duo turns my mind to the hidden folk and forgotten things we overlook in everyday life. So I wanted to do my part in remedying the constant lamenting of dark folk malaise uh, by instead using my platform as an opportunity to spotlight up-and-coming dark folk new age acts uh, who are trying to do something new. But don't mistake this as like a free act of charity, which I just start throwing at any album regardless of quality. The album still has to be good, as is fortunately the case with Nordstilla's Odrungal. With this album, we find ourselves fortunate enough to find something that is both unique and accomplishes what it sets out to do in the dark folk genre. It is a ritual of slowing down and looking inward. And for that reason alone, I hope you all take the time to listen to what Nordstilla has crafted for all of us. Alright guys, and with that, that is the very last album I am reviewing for this month. April is not looking to slow down at all compared to March. Uh, what, we've got uh, Tyr, Korpiklani, Kati Raun. Uh, Varjuna has a new single coming out Friday. I don't know if that's before or after I post this, but the Nordic music train never stops rolling. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for giving me feedback on what album review format you prefer. Uh, I'm definitely going to be keeping this one around as with the Nordic Sound Journal and uh, the Medium uh, articles for those of you who really need it uh, written so you can read it on your own time without clicking through YouTube interfaces. So thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, take care, and I hope you guys have a great month. See you next time.